We're going to go now to Choman Hardy, who's going to address in more detail the question of the displaced, in particular, the needs of women who make up a huge percentage, as you know, of the, of the displaced people. I'm going to talk about the gender dimension of war and forced displacement. So I'm going to focus on four points. One of them is the human cost to lives, how that changes. The second one is the consequences of forced migration and forced displacement. The third point is about the reinforcement of gender roles. And finally, about the, the way um, social and economic inequalities are reinforced after conflict. So what do I mean when I say that the war is gendered? War and genocide and ethnic cleansing. I mean by that is, what I mean by that is that war affects men and women differently. So the majority of the victims um, and the majority of the people who get killed in the battlefields are men. That's a fact, we know that. But women, how are they targeted differently than men? Most women, especially at times of genocide and ethnic cleansing, are targeted through rape and forced impregnation. And this is the case that we saw in the Yazidi genocide. Why is that so different? Why are men and women treated differently? Well, men and women are perceived as two different beings. One of them, man, is supposed to be the aggressive and the protector and a threat to the enemy. Therefore, he's annihilated very quickly. Whereas women are seen as biological reproducers of the group, but they're also responsible for socialization of children, therefore they carry on the identity of the group. And that is why destroying women symbolically through raping them and through forcible, uh, forc forced impregnation means you destroy the identity and the honor of that group. It's also a way to emasculate, emasculate the men of that group. Men are traditionally perceived to be the protectors and the providers for their families and for their nations. If they can't fulfill that role, then they feel feminized, and this has long-term consequences for them in the post-conflict. About forced displacement, um, we have had numbers about the numbers of IDPs and refugees that um, are residing in Iraq, and majority of whom are in Kurdistan and how um, uprootedness is le leads to loss of social status and economic status. It's a plunge in the status of a person who lives in their own neighborhood, has their own job, goes to their places of, of worship, and suddenly all of that has been taken away and they're being taken somewhere where they are not valued as they had been before. One thing that I should mention is that in Kurdistan in particular, and I think it's true for Iraq, we're very new to this idea. We have been a country that's uh, been affected by waves of violence and dictatorship and genocide. As a result of that, we have been refugees elsewhere. We have been displaced elsewhere. And this is probably the first time we are receiving IDPs and refugees in the region. And I think despite the lack of experience, we haven't done too badly, but we have a lot still to go. And it's also a new experience of diversification. Suddenly, um, a city like Soleimaniya, which was very much Kurdish, and it didn't have many ethnic and religious minorities, now suddenly has ethnic and religious minorities. And sometimes it doesn't, know, it doesn't know how to deal with it. And I think these are areas that need to be worked on if we're going to prevent future social, social problems and conflict between these different groups. As we saw, and as the minister and um, international agencies told us, usually at the early st stages we are dealing with survival needs of refugees and IDPs. We just want to make sure that they do not die. But of course, as years go by, and we have to understand that some of these IDPs and refugees will stay, and they should have the right to stay, and they should be accepted, then there will be other needs like access to education, equal access to jobs and the market, but also just rights, the, ha the right to have rights like anyone else in the community. And that's Hannah Arendt's concept that minorities, and especially IDPs and refugees, are a group of people who are considered 
they don't have the right to have rights, and I think that's something that we need to work on if we are, if we're going to prevent further and future problems. Um, we have seen it in, for example, in the case of the Anfal genocide, many of these refugee camps or IDP camps became small towns. Now, when I did my research about the Anfal genocide in 2006 and 7, that's like 28 and 29 years after the genocide, the roads were still unpaved. It was an ugly dormitory town suffering a lot, and the young people in particular hadn't had much to do. So I, I think we have to bear that in mind, that these camps that are currently tents, they will gradually turn into towns, and how are we going to make sure they're not going to be marginalized groups of people, and how are we going to integrate them into the community? The third point was about reinforcement of gender roles. What, what do I mean by that? So um, men of the targeted group, men who have been, the, the community that's been waged, uh, the war has been waged upon them, feel emasculated, as I mentioned before. And that's for several reasons. One of them is that they're supposed to provide for their families. But when they are being disabled or when they're being forcibly displaced, they lose their role as the breadwinner. And therefore, they feel feminized. And the loss of power is experienced very negatively. They're also supposed to be protectors of their wives and children. So in the case of men whose wives were taken away, children were murdered or raped, then again they feel very powerless and angry. The third thing is they're supposed to be protecting the nation and land. So they are supposed to be the army. And if they have lost the war, it's a, loss, it's a blow to their masculinity. And sometimes, also in post-conflict situations, in refugee and IDP camps, women, their wives, their sisters, their mothers find work when the men themselves can't. The social roles are reversed, and all of that puts a lot of pressure on man, who's supposed to be the protector and provider. And sometimes in post-war conflict, the men reinforce their masculinity and manhood through controlling women's bodies and also through making decisions. And hence, we see the sexual and gender-based violence in the camps and post-conflict situations. We also see early marriage and forced marriage. And a lot of the traditional gender roles are reproduced. And in fact, they are made even worse than before. The fourth point I want to address is the creation of a traumatized and improv impoverished underclass. Now, usually, societies are not a utopia. They usually have groups of communities that are marginalized and silenced, and they have inferior status compared to others. Now, when war and violence and genocide comes, these social cleavages are enhanced. The conflict becomes deeper, and women suddenly become head of household in the case of those who've lost their husbands and in the case of those whose husbands are disabled. But while they become breadwinners for their children and the elderly members of the family, they still have to work in a very traditional society that doesn't respect women, doesn't value her, doesn't see her as equal, but sees her as inferior. And on the other hand, sees her as easy prey because she has no husband to protect her and no father. Therefore, sexually, she will become a target. And we have seen cases of honor killing resulting from women taking charge, going out to work, earning the bread for children, and then being targeted by brothers-in-law and extended members of family. So if these are the problems, what can we do? I think, um, yes, this has been a time of crisis and on several levels. Um, I think it's also a time, for, uh, an, a time of opportunity. Many of the social power structures, traditional structures that we're used to, are being messed up now. The gender roles are all confused. Many people have moved around. A diversity has come about that didn't exist before. Um, all these, uh, and, and the dire economic situation, I think, um, gives us hope that maybe if we do it right, we can change even the inequalities that exist. One thing that I wanted to stress is that usually, um, and thanks to international aid and all the international NGOs and agencies, a lot of focus has been on supporting IDP and refugee support, um, livelihood and cohesion and so on. And I think this, is, this may be potentially dangerous if you're ignoring the host community, which itself is suffering from poverty and uh, a lot of inequality and problems. So I think if you are 
100% um, supporting IDP refugee communities without any concentration of the host community, you are potentially creating another problem of envy and competition, and I think that needs to be addressed. Um, another way I think is very important for us to look at other countries. How do they integrate um, their communities, newcomer communities of refugees? How has Europe done it? How did other communities like us, for example, who have recovered from violence and conflict, have recovered the, from the, all of this? We could look at Rwanda, South Africa. We could look at neighboring countries, and I think we have a lot to learn. Um, I don't think I have any solution to propose, but I think it is a very sensitive time, and we can, if we do it right, we can integrate this community and we can challenge gender roles, we can challenge the social structure, and we can have a more progressive, open, diverse, and pluralist society. Thank you. Thank you.